Hello everyone, welcome to the channel Amazing Civil Engineering Studies. Hello friends in this video we will study about Stones types, properties, tests, applications, advantages and disadvantages. Stones are obtained in the form of rock which is a solid portion of Earth's crust. Rocks are quarried from mines and mountains by manual process, chemical process. Dynamites, or by mechanically operated machines. Method to be used depend upon the nature of quarry and amount of stone to be obtained. Before excavation of rocks from quarries, quarries are surveyed to estimate the amount and quality of rock that can be obtained from the quarry. Quarried rock may be in the form of blocks, aggregates, slabs etc. Stones are properly dressed and shaped before it is used in work. This classification is based on the mode or process of formation of a rock. Thus, some rocks may be formed from natural hot molten materials. Others may be formed at ordinary temperatures from compaction of particles or sediments, and still. Stones are classified as per the rock from which they are obtained. Geological Types of Rocks Chemical Types of Rocks Silicious Rocks Calcareous Rocks Argillaceous Rocks Structural, Physical, Rock Types Unstratified, massive, rocks. Stratified, layered, rocks. Foliated rocks. Classification of rocks. Igneous rock. Sedimentary rock. Metamorphic rock. Igneous rocks. Rocks which are formed after the cooling of magma of volcano are called igneous rocks. Granite, dolerite are some examples of igneous rocks. All those rocks that have been formed by cooling and crystallization from an originally hot and molten material are grouped as igneous rocks. They are the most abundant rocks of the crust depth-wise. The hot molten material occurs below the surface of the earth and is known as magma. Quite often, it erupts out at the surface as lava from cracks in the crust called volcanoes. Magma may cool and crystallize below the surface and change it into solid rocks. Similarly, lava flowing over the surface, even underwater in oceans, may also change it into rocks. Three different types of igneous rocks are thus formed. Plutonic, formed at great depths, generally from 210 km below the surface. These have coarse crystals. Examples, granites, cyanites gabbros. Hippabyssal, formed at the intermediate depth below the surface generally up to 2 km. These have mixed characters. Examples, porphyries of various types. The platonic and hippabyssal are sometimes grouped as intrusive rocks. Volcanic, these are formed on the surface of the earth even underwater in oceans from the cooling of lava from volcanoes. They are also called extrusive rocks and are commonly made up of very fine crystals. Examples, basalts and traps. Sedimentary rocks Sedimentary rocks are formed by deposition of broken materials such as clay, sand, rocks at Earth's surface and within water bodies. Limestone and sandstone are some examples of sedimentary rocks. 
These types of rocks are also called secondary rocks. At any time, the existing rocks on the surface of the earth are being broken into smaller particles by the natural process of decay and decomposition called weathering and erosion. Atmospheric gases, temperature variation, wind, water and ice are some natural agencies which break the existing rocks into small fragments and sediments. These particles are then carried away and deposited at other places such as at seabed, lake bed, river bed, and so on. Gradually, the accumulated particles get compressed and compacted under their own load and are thereby transformed into rock-solid cohesive masses of particles. In some cases, the particles may be bound together by some natural cementing material, with or without any pressure. These are also sedimentary rocks. In seas and oceans, a large number of sea organisms live and die. Their hard parts also accumulate at the seabed and are gradually transformed into rocks. Since the particles in such rocks are derived from organisms, they are called organically formed sedimentary rocks in comparison to the mechanically formed sedimentary rocks of the first type. The third category of sedimentary rocks is formed due to chemical processes like evaporation and precipitation. Naturally, they are designated as chemically formed sedimentary rocks. The sedimentary rocks are very widespread, area-wise, on the surface of the earth. Depth-wise, however, they form only a small proportion of the crust. Best known and common sedimentary rocks are sandstones, quartzite, limestones, dolomites, and shales. Metamorphic rocks Metamorphic rocks are formed by the process of metamorphism. Metamorphism is the realignment of minerals due to temperature change or pressure change which results in the formation of new rock. Marble and schist are some example of metamorphic rocks. This rock type is originally either igneous rocks or sedimentary rocks which have undergone some change in their structure, shape, or composition. The change might have been due to an increase in temperature or pressure or both. Sometimes, the change is due to some chemically active fluids that act on the pre-existing rocks. The nature of change in the rock will depend on The nature of existing rock The type of factors operating on the rock, temperature, pressure, fluids The intensity of factors the duration of action Very interesting new rock type may be formed from pre-existing igneous or sedimentary rocks depending upon the above conditions. Thus limestone, a sedimentary rock, may change to a variety of marbles. Similarly, sandstone, again a sedimentary rock, may change into a very hard quartzite. Granite, igneous rock, changes to gneiss and shale, a sedimentary rock, into the so well-known metamorphic rock slate. Another very important fundamental fact about these metamorphic changes in rocks is that they all take place essentially in a solid state. The original rocks are heated and compressed but seldom melted. Once melted and recrystallized, they form igneous and not metamorphic rocks. Chemical Types of Rocks On the basis of dominant chemical composition, following three types of rock are commonly recognized. Silicious Rocks 
These rocks have silica, SiO. 2. More than 50%, as the predominant component. Some sedimentary and metamorphic rocks like quartizites may be made up almost entirely, 98 to 100%, of silica. Naturally, they are considered among the strongest building stones. Some igneous and metamorphic rocks like granites and gneisses respectively have predominantly silicious composition. When free from decomposed minerals and micas, these rocks also form excellent building stones. Calcareous Rocks In these types of rocks, the dominant component is a carbonate more than 50%, generally of calcium and also of magnesium. Most commonly they belong to sedimentary and metamorphic groups of geological classification. Best known examples of calcareous or carbonate rocks are limestones, dolomites, and marbles. Argillaceous rocks They are mostly sedimentary and metamorphic rocks having clay more than 50%, hydrous aluminous silicate of Ca, Mg, Ka etc., as the predominant component. The sedimentary varieties are known as claystones, siltstones, and shales. They are generally soft and disintegrate easily in the presence of water resulting into muddy slush. The metamorphic varieties are fillites and slates. These represent thoroughly baked and indurated shales. They are quite hard and brittle but being invariably thin-layered are of only limited use in building construction. Structural, Physical, Rock Types These types of rocks are grouped into three broad classes depending upon the presence or absence of layered structure and when layered, on the nature of layered structures. The three types are unstratified, massive, rocks. These types of rocks are free from any layered structure. They form extensive masses of almost same general structure depth-wise and area-wise. Most of the igneous rocks fall in this class. Stratified, layered, rocks. In this rock type very easily observed layered structure is the dominant quality. The layers may be thin, 1 cm or so, or thick, 1 meter and above, and of same or different color and composition. Most of the sedimentary rocks are stratified in nature. Foliated Rocks these type of rocks generally belong to a metamorphic group where a layered structure has been induced under lateral pressure. In a foliated rock, the layers are easily separable as the cohesion between the adjoining layers is least, sometimes negligible. The best example of a foliated rock is slate, gneisses, and schists also show foliation. Stones Stones form one of the most important building materials in civil engineering. Stones are derived from rocks, which form the Earth's crust and have no definite shape or chemical combination but are mixtures of two or more minerals. The mineral is a substance which is formed by the natural inorganic process and possesses a definite chemical combination and molecular structure. They are strong, durable, and descent in appearance. Among the most commonly used building stones, the following types of stones are important. Granites. Traps, limestone, sandstones, marbles, and gneisses. Quarrying of stones, its methods, selection of site, 
Preparation Steps Definition Stones occur in the form of natural rock masses or layers on the surface. The process of extraction of suitable stones from their natural rock beds or layers is commonly called quarrying of stones. It differs from the mining of ores of metals in that whereas quarrying is an operation carried out entirely on the surface, mining involves digging below the ground, sometimes at considerable depth. A quarry is a place where different types of stones are extracted. Selection of Site for Quarrying of Stones Engineers and contractors have to keep following factors into consideration while deciding about the location of a quarry site. Availability of Sound Rock A quarry can be opened up only where a sound rock that can yield good quality building stones exists in the considerable area. Once opened the quarry should be able to supply the stones for quite a few years. The stone must be available in large quantity and must be of uniform quality. Distance from the areas of construction Quarrying is commonly a commercial operation. The quarry must not be located far away from the area where constructional activities are going on. In such a case when it is located far away, the cost of transport of stone from the quarry to constructional sites may become too heavy. At the same time, a quarry must not be located very close to a town because quarrying operations are full of hazards. This becomes especially important when blasting method has to be used for quarrying of stones. Distance from main roads Stones extracted from a quarry have to be transported to the nearby towns and cities. Naturally, the quarry must be located near to the main network of roads leading to those towns and cities. Otherwise, longer approach roads will have to be constructed that will add to the cost of haulage of the stone. Availability of Water and Dumping Space in quarrying operations, considerable manpower is employed. Water is an important necessity for the workforce. It must be available in sufficient quantity near the quarry site. Similarly, quarrying operations involve a lot of breaking of different types of rocks all of which are not useful for building construction. Such waste rock or refuse has to be dumped on one or other side of the quarry, so that main quarry face is not blocked. The required dumping space should be easily available near the quarry. Another factor is drainage system. Ground water and surface water have to be quickly drained. It should be possible to provide adequate drainage at the quarry site. Preparation Steps for Stone Quarrying Once a site for a quarry is decided, following preparatory steps become necessary for starting the operation. Selection of Method for Quarrying At present, quarrying can be done either by manual methods or by machines. The method has to be chosen right in the beginning. The choice will depend upon the size of the quarry, the nature of the rock and the demand for building stones. Preparation of a layout, in accordance with the method selected for quarrying of stones, a scheme or layout for quarrying will be prepared. This will determine from which side the natural rock bed will be extracted first, the attack face and how the extraction will progress in the subsequent phases. Removal of the overburden, the surface of natural rock beds are invariably covered by some thickness of soil or loose material. 
Irrespective of the methods of quarrying of stones, this overburden has to be cleared first before the actual quarrying operation could be started. Similarly, some loosely held rocks on the slopes have to be removed to avoid accidents in the later operations. Methods of Quarrying of Stones Quarrying methods are classified differently. It is convenient to divide them under two main headings, namely, quarrying without blasting and quarrying by blasting. Quarrying of Stones Without Blasting In these methods, blocks of rocks are broken loose from their natural outcrops by men using hand tools or special purpose channeling machines. No explosive material is used at any stage in this method of quarrying of stones. Soft rocks and also those rocks which have layered structure are easily quarried by these methods. As a first step, the loose cover of soil over the rock, the overburden, is first removed and the rock surface is cleared. It is then systematically broken into blocks of desired sizes either by driving wedges or by cutting channels. The Wedge Method of Quarrying It is consists of digging a few holes at carefully selected places on the rock. These holes are dug either manually using chisels and hammers by the skilled workers. Or, in major quarrying, these holes may be drilled by special machines called hammer drills. Once the hole is ready, a steel wedge is inserted in between two steel strips or feathers. This is done with all the holes drilled in a sequence. Such firmly inserted wedges are then struck with a hammer almost simultaneously. This process develops cracks along the lines joining the holes. After that, long iron bars are inserted in the holes and cracks, and then the blocks of the rocks are pushed forward onto the free face of a quarry. The Channeling Method of Quarrying In this method of quarrying, involves the use of big machines called channelizers which have reciprocating cutting tools and are power driven. When single large blocks of costly stones like marbles and limestones are required, this method is most suitable. The channelizer can cut a groove as deep as 3 meters, as wide as 5 centimeters and as long as 3 meters, or even more. When a single block is required, grooves of required depth and length are first cut at the back and sides of the working face of the quarry. Holes are then drilled from the free front side horizontally to meet the back channel at its base. Using wedges and rods, the block is separated from the rock and hoisted up to the transporting lorries or wagons. Single blocks as big as 10 meters long and 3 meters thick and 1 to 3 meters wide can be quarried by this method from soft rocks. Quarrying by Heating It is an old, crude method which may be useful locally for obtaining small quantities of stones. Rocks are heated for a few hours by burning heaps of firewood over their surface. Such a process results in expansion of the upper layers and their cracking and separating from the lower layers. Quarrying of Stones by Blasting This method consists of using explosives for breaking stones from very hard rocks. It has been observed that quarrying of granites, basalts, traps, quartzites, and sandstones by wedging and other methods is very laborious and costly. These hard rocks, however, can be loosened economically and easily by using explosives. The basic principle of this method is to explode a small quantity of an explosive material at a calculated depth within the rocks. 
The force generated due to this explosion is sufficient only to create cracks and loosen blocks of good size. Blasting for quarrying for stones may be quite different from blasting for road clearance. In the latter case, the size of the broken stone is of not much consequence. Quarrying by blasting, therefore, requires very experienced persons thoroughly acquainted with blasting explosives on the one hand and strength qualities of rocks on the other hand. Quarrying by blasting involves a series of systematic operations such as drilling of blast holes, charging of blast holes and firing the shots. Drilling of Blast Holes A blast hole is a hole of suitable diameter and depth driven at a properly selected location on a rock for being charged with an explosive. It may be driven either manually or mechanically. In mechanical drilling, machines such as hammer drills, percussive drills, or rotary drills are used depending on the nature of the rock. In the quarrying by blasting, the diameter, depth, number, and spacing of boreholes require very careful considerations for getting the most beneficial result. The diameter of the hole is determined with the type of explosive being used. For explosives that come in standard sized cartridges, the diameter has to be slightly greater than the size of the cartridges for allowing easy insertion. Bulletin when blasting powder has to be used, the diameter of blast holes will depend on the quantity of explosive to be accommodated as also the convenience of drilling the holes. The depth of blast hole depends on the volume of rock to be broken in one shot which is also related to the quantity of the explosive that has to be charged into the hole. The spacing of holes has to be decided carefully when a number of holes are to be charged and fired simultaneously. A given quantity of any explosive can induce cracks break open or throw away limited volumes of rock around it on exploding. Naturally, when holes are too closely spaced, they will shatter the rock into smaller, useless pieces. When they are spaced too far off from each other, cracking caused on their explosion will not break the entire aimed rock mass in the desired manner. Properly spaced holes charged with calculated quantities of explosive will not only break the calculated volume of rock into blocks of manageable size but also throw them at a proper distance from the quarry. While spacing the holes, the distance from the free side of the quarry is kept into consideration. On exploding, the main thrust is along the shortest distance to the free side. This distance is called the line of least resistance if this line is of considerable length the shot may prove effective similarly if this distance is too short the broken stone may be thrown far away from the quarry charging of blast hole the loading or charging of the blast holes with predetermined quantities of the selected type of explosive is to be done with great care and caution. A slight negligence in this operation may lead to fatal accidents. Following are some important steps to keep in mind while charging the blast hole. The holes are first cleared of all the obstructions and irregularities with the help of wooden rumping rods. Explosive in the form of powder packs or cartridges is then inserted in small quantity at a time. Before adding the next batch of explosive, the previously placed quantity is packed firmly by using wooden tamping rods, metallic rods are never used. When blasting powder is used as an explosive charge, a fuse is inserted. 
in the case of charges in the form of cartridges a primer cartridge, which has a highly sensitive explosive, it is also inserted and is connected to asafeti fuse. The hole is generally filled from 1-3 to 1-2 its depth with the explosive. The hole is then summed. Stemming consists of filling the remaining 2 thirds to 1 half depth of blast hole, above the last compacted layer of explosive, with inert and non-combustible material like powdered clay, rock and, sand. This is also done in installments. Each installment of the stemming material is thoroughly compacted before placing the second layer. The main object of the stemming process is to prevent the escape of the gases produced by the explosion through the hole. They are made to pass to other directions and do the job of breaking the rock by their energy. It is also customary to put the safety fuse, for firing at the beginning of stemming operation. In another arrangement, a thin rod is kept inserted in the hole during the stemming process. This rod is removed at the completion of stemming, and the fuse is inserted in its place. Sometimes stemming is done in layers alternating with explosive layers. This becomes almost necessary in deep holes involving the use of large quantities of an explosive in each shot. Firing of the shot The main explosive in the blast hole. It is the final step involving igniting the explosive in the blast holes by using asafeti fuse or by electric detonators. A safety fuse is essentially a thin strain of gunpowder properly wrapped in a cotton thread. When ignited, it burns from one end to the other end at a fixed speed, generally 100 to 130 seconds per meter. One end of such a fuse length is connected to the blasting cap of the primer cartridge. The other free end of the fuse trails at the surface. It is this free end that is ignited by the firing man who has time at his disposal to run to a place of safety proportional to the length of the fuse. An electrical detonator is a specially designed metallic cap which contains a highly sensitive charge filled in it, over the charge hangs a thin copper filament which conducts an electric charge. As the current is switched on, the filament in the detonator gives a powerful spark. This ignites the sensitive charge which makes a small explosion that is sufficient to blow. Types of stones Their structure, composition, and properties Among the most commonly used building stones, the following types of stones are important. Granite, traps, limestone, sandstone, marbles, and gneisses. Types of stones Granites Basalts, traps Limestone Marble Sandstones Gneisses Laterite Slates Granites A typical granite is an igneous rock. Its essential mineral components are mineral orthoclase and mineral quartz. It may also contain small quantities of accessory minerals like hornblende, mica, and tourmaline, etc. Texture and Structure Granites are coarse to medium grained in texture, massive, unlayered and crystalline in structure. Color, they are commonly of light colors and often spotted. Granites occur in appealing colors and have a capacity to take very fine, glossy, mirror-like finish on polishing. Building Properties 
most granites possess excellent building properties such as, high strength and hardness, low absorption value, least porosity, good resistance to frost and weathering, excellent durability. These have, however, poor resistance to fire. Basalts, Traps This types of stones are also called traps. These are volcanic igneous rocks that have formed from cooling of lava erupting from volcanoes. Composition, the basalts show a significant variation in their mineral composition. Among their essential minerals, the felspas and ferromagnesium minerals like augite and hornblende must be mentioned. Texture and Structure Basalts and traps are fine textured crystalline rocks which sometimes show cavities and pores due to escape of gases at the time of cooling of lava. Color, because of their composition, being rich in ferromagnesium minerals, most basalts are dark or light dark in appearance. Building properties, basalts, like granites, possess very high strength values. They are resistant to weather and being fine textured impervious to moisture, except when rich in gaseous cavities. Being very hard, they are very difficult to dress in fine shapes. Limestones Limestones are sedimentary rocks of calcareous composition and generally showing a stratified structure. They are made up of calcium carbonate. Composition The essential mineral of all limestones are calcite, CaCO. 3. Which may make up as much as 99% of some limestones. Most limestones, however, consist of a good proportion of magnesium carbonate, MgCO. 3. Texture and structure, most limestones are invariably fine textured. Some of them may contain fossils. In structure, they may be stratified or sometimes massive. They also show great variation in texture and structure. Color, it varies greatly in limestones. From pure white, chalk, varieties, limestones of grey and dark varieties are also known. The color depends on the presence of accessory minerals finely dispersed in the carbonate matrix. Building Properties All limestones are not useful for building construction. Some varieties may be practically unfit, those which are rich in clay or are very soft. Whereas other varieties of limestones may make excellent building stones. These are dense, compact, fine textured varieties which are free from cavities and cracks. They can be easily dressed and take a very fine polish. The use of limestones as facing stones should be avoided in areas where the air is polluted with industrial gases and also in coastal regions where saltish winds can attack them. In both cases, air is likely to strike the rock chemically and change its surface to spots of reactive compounds. Limestones are widely used in the making of cement. Marble Marble is a metamorphic rock of calcareous composition and often of a layered structure. Composition Marble is formed in nature from limestone through the process of metamorphism. Its essential mineral is recrystallized calcite, caco. 3. Besides, it may have some impurities finely dispersed throughout the mass. Texture and Structure In texture, 
marble is a fine-grained rock with a form granular. Sugar-like grains, surface. It shows metamorphic structures developed under heat. Color, marble occurs in almost all colors from pure white to dense black. The color of marble depends on the impurities that are finely distributed in it during its formation. Building properties, an excellent quality marble satisfies all the requisite properties of a building stone. They are quite strong, uniform in texture, least porous and take an excellent polish. They are suitable both as ornamental stones and for general construction. Sandstones These types of stones are sedimentary rocks, silicious in composition and mostly stratified in structure. Composition The essential mineral of all the sandstones is quartz, SiO. 2. Among the accessory minerals, micas, felspas, and dark minerals are sometimes present. In cemented varieties of sandstones, the cementing material may be silicious, ferruginous, calcareous or clayey in nature. And this is most important in as far as defining the suitability of a sandstone for building construction is concerned. Texture and structure, they occur in medium to fine grain texture and stratified structure. Color, sandstones occur in many colors, white, gray, pink, red, maroon, and dark. Building properties, some sandstones are excellent building stones. These are the varieties that have a light color, and are rich in quartz and have a silicious cement and a line-grained uniform texture. They must be free from fine layers or minerals like mica and chlorite. Nices A nice is geologically a metamorphic rock. It is generally silicious in composition and foliated or banded in structure. In most cases, it resembles closely with granite from which metamorphism commonly derives it. Composition Nices show wide variation in a mineral composition which depends on the source rock. Granites changing into gneisses generally contain the same minerals, the only structure is altered. Felspas, quartz, ferromagnesium minerals and mica are among the main constituents of gneisses. Texture and structure, in texture, gneisses are coarsely crystalline rocks. They often show a banded or layered structure in which case mica minerals are segregated in distinct bands separating felspas and other granular minerals. This destroys the usefulness of gneiss as a building material. Building properties, when coarsely crystalline and uniformly textured, gneisses are as good building stones as granites. These are varieties light in appearance and free from mica. Dark colored, mica rich and banded types, however, are to be discarded. Laterite this type of stones are sedimentary rock composed mainly of oxides of aluminum with varying amounts of oxides of iron. Texture and structure, the rock is formed from the chemical decomposition of alkaline igneous rocks by leaching of some components. This results in the development of porous or spongy texture of laterites. Building properties the laterites are light to dark red in color depending upon the quantity of iron in their composition. They are poor in compressive strength which varies from 20 to 30 kg cm2.
They are quite often used in the ordinary type of construction and also as arrowed material. Slates These type of stone are the metamorphic rock with a distinct foliated, cleavage. Structure dotted is commonly silicious in composition. Texture and structure, slate is a very fine textured rock so much so that its constituents can hardly be identified even under a microscope. It shows typical slat cleavage which means that the rock can be split into large thin sheets in certain directions. This slat cleavage makes it an excellent rooting material for ordinary construction. Building Properties Slate shows great variation in its building properties which depend on the thickness of the sheets and the color of the rock. Black colored thin sheets are used for ordinary roofing. This type of stones are practically impervious to moisture. Thickly layered slates have a good compressive strength and may find use in sills and for pavements. So. The above were some of the different types of stones. 16 Types of Dressing of Stones, Its Methods, Objectives Stone found in nature, have to be quarried from their thick beds. After quarrying large pieces of rocks, it is essential to break them into smaller sizes so that they can be used in buildings. A place where exposed surfaces of good quality natural rocks are abundantly available is known as quarry, and the process of taking out stones from the natural bed is known as quarrying. This is done with the help of hand tools like a pickaxe, chisels, etc., or with the help of machines. Blasting using explosives is another method used in quarrying. The dressing of stones is important so that they are dressed in suitable shapes and polished to give a smooth surface if desired. The stones are used in different types of masonry, therefore, it has to be cut and shaped to fit in the type of work needed. Dressing of Stones Definition the dressing of stone is defined as the process of giving a proper size, shape and finish to the roughly broken stones as obtained from the quarry. This is done with the help of hand tools like a pickaxe, chisels, etc., or with the help of machines. This process is done manually or mechanically. A dressed stone is fit for use in a particular situation in a building. Objectives Stones obtained from the quarries are very rough and irregular in shape and quite bulky in size and weight. Various objectives of dressing are below. To reduce the size To give a proper shape to the stone to obtain an appealing finish. Various objectives of dressing are below. To reduce the size of the big blocks of stones so that they are converted to easily liftable pieces. This reduction in size is generally carried out at the quarry itself because that saves a lot of transportation costs. To give a proper shape to the stone. It is known that stones can be used at different places in the building, e.g., in foundations, in walls, in arches, or for flooring. Each situation will require a proper shape. This can be given at the quarry and also at the site of construction. To obtain an appealing finish In a residential building, stones are used not only because of their extra strength, hardness and durability but also because of their aesthetic value. Stone surfaces can be made very decorative and of appealing appearance, which will last for a considerable time. 
A stone house has its distinct individuality in a city of concrete structures. Stages in the dressing of stone The different stages of dressing of stones are 1. Sizing It is the process of inducing the irregular blocks to the desired dimensions by removing extra portions. It is done with the help of hand hammers and chisels. 2. Shaping this follows sizing and involves removing the sharp projections. Many stones are used in common construction after shaping. 3. Planing This is rather an advanced type of dressing in which the stone is cleared off all the irregularities from the surface. 4. Finishing this is done only in case of specially dressed stones and consists of rubbing of the surface of stones with suitable abrasive materials such as silicon carbide. 5. Polishing This is the last stage in dressing and is only done on marbles, limestone, and granite. Methods Types of Dressing of Stones as said earlier, dressing of stone can be done both manually as well as mechanically. Manually, skilled stonesmiths can work wonders on the suitable type of stones with chisels and hammers and abrasives. Mechanically, machines can cut the stone to any desired size and shape. Their surfaces can be made extra smooth by polishing through machines. There are, however, some traditional types of dressing of stones which are quite popular even at present. They are described below in brief. Pitched dressing In pitched dressing, only the edges of a stone block are made level with the help of a hammer. The superfluous mass on the face is generally left intact. Hammer dressing It is that type of dressing in which large raised portions of the stones are broken off, and the stone is shaped somewhat flat but rough due to hammer marks. A hammered dressed stone has no sharp and irregular corners and has a comparatively even surface to fit well in the masonry. These stone blocks are squared, and the bed and vertical sides are dressed to a distance of 8 to 10 cm from the face. This is done to enable the stone to have proper joints. This work is done by using the Waller's hammer. The obtained stones are termed as hammer-faced, quarry-faced, or rustic-faced. Chisel drafting In this method, drafts or grooves are made with the help of a chisel at all the four edges, and any excessive stone from the center is then removed. Any superfluous stone from the center is then removed. Chisel drafted stones are specially used in plinths and corners of the buildings. Rough tooling The edges are first squared by using a chisel and hammer. Then a series of grooves of variable width, 4 to 5 cm, more or less parallel to the tool marks, are developed over the surface of the stone. Punched dressing in this method of dressing of stone, about 1 cm vertical or horizontal grooves are sunk with a chisel having its shaped as a hollow semicircle. The sides of the rock are kept chamfered or sunk. It is done on the stones that have already been rough tooled. With the help of chisels, a series of parallel ridges are developed on the stone surface. It is also called furrowed finish. Close picked and fine tooling. 
A punchade stone is then further dressed so as to obtain a finer surface. This is an extreme type of dressing of stone in which almost every projection is removed from all the sides of the stone. Its surface is given a fine texture and appealing look. Boasted or droved finish It is a very common type dressing of stone, in which the surface of the stone is covered with parallel marks that may run in any direction. A boaster, which is actually a wide edged chisel, is used for this purpose. These marks may be horizontal or at any angle. The chisel marks are not continuous across the whole width of the stone. Scab bling Irregular edges of the stones are broken off, and the stone is shaped. This work is generally done in a quarry, and the edges are broken with a scabling hammer. Reticulated finish In this type of dressing of stones, irregularly shaped sinking is made within the central portion of the stones having a 2 cm wide margin on its sides. These sinking are about 6 mm deep. The margin around the sinking is of constant width. The sunk surfaces may have punched marks to give a better appearance. Vermiculated finish This type of dressing of stone is the same as the reticulated finish except that they are more curved and give a worm eaten type appearance. It is not very common as they need a lot of labor for construction. Coomed or dragged finish This type of finish is done on soft stones. A comb is driven over the surface of this stone to remove it all elevating portions. Picked dressing This type of dressing of stones is obtained by finishing the stone with a point, and the depression is smaller than the above type. Molded finish Molding is done to improve the appearance of stones. These are either handmade or machine made. Rubbed finish In this method of dressing of stone, the surfaces of stones are rubbed to get a smoother finish. One piece of stone is rubbed against the other. Water and sand are added to aid the operation. It can also be rubbed by hand or machines. Polished surfaces Stones that can take polish, e.g., granites, marbles, limestones, etc., are first rubbed and then polished by using rubber, pad, sand, water, and putty powder. However, a machine can also be used for polishing. Sand blasting This method of dressing of stone is done to imprint lettering and design on the surface of the granite. The polished surface is coated with a molten rubber-like compound that solidifies on cooling. The desired design is cut on this coating with a sharp tool thereby exposing the stone surface, which is to be cut. A blast of sand is then blown with compressed air, the part which is exposed is cut to the depth needed. Characteristics or properties of a good building stone Stone can be easily carved or dressed. Stone should have high resistance to weathering and fire actions. Stone must be polished properly. Stone should have better appearance and color. Stone should have high workability and durability. Stone should have high toughness. Stone should have low water absorption. Specific gravity of stone must be between 2.3 to 2.8.
stone should have compact and equiangular structure. Should have uniform color. Stone should have high crushing strength, greater than 98 N mm2. Tests on building stones. Tests which are to be conducted on stones for selecting it as a building material. Acid test. Acid test is used to investigate how much atmospheric action can be resisted by stone. In this test 100 grams of stones in chipped form are kept in a 5% solution of hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. After three days stones in chipped form are taken out and dried. If the edges of stones are sharp as earlier, it indicates that stone can resist weathering actions. Smith's Test This test is used for finding out the presence of soluble matter in stones. In this test few sample of stones are placed in a glass or test tube filled with clean water. Stones are kept in water for 1 HOUR. After this the glass or test tube is vigorously shaken. Due to presence of earthy material and clay impurities water is converted to dirty water. Slightly cloudiness of water will prove that the stones are good and durable. If water becomes too dirty, it indicates that stone contains too much soluble impurities and it is not suitable for construction. Crushing Strength Crushing test is used to investigate the compressive strength of stone. In this test stone is cut into cubes of dimension 40 mm sides of cube are finely dressed and finished. Cubes of stones are then kept in water for 72 hours. Then 5 mm thick layer of plywood or plaster of Paris is applied on the load-bearing surface. Load is applied axially on load-bearing surface using universal testing machine or crushing testing machine until cracks appear on the stone or stone starts crushing. Crushing strength of the stone is the maximum load at which it crushes divided by the area of the load-bearing surface. Water Absorption Test In this test, 50 grams of stones in chipped form are places in an oven at 105 degrees Celsius for 3 HOURS then cooled at room temperature. Weight of stones is then taken, W1. Then stones are places in distilled water for 3 days. After 3 days weight of stones is taken, W2. Percentage percent of water absorption should not exceed 15%, otherwise stone is not suitable for construction. Absorption of water, percent, equals times Crystallization test Four cubes of stone with dimension 40 mm are taken. Stones are dried for three days and weighed. Then stones are immersed in 14% solution of sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, for two hours. After this stones are dried at 100 degrees centigrade and weighed. Difference in weight is noted. Process of drying, weighing, immersion and reweighing is repeated at least five times. Each time, change in weight is noted and it is expressed as a percentage of original weight. Percentage of wear should not exceed 2% for good stone. Percentage of wear equals Times Hardness test this test is carried out to determine the hardness of stone. First weight of specimen is taken, W1. 
the specimen is filled in a test cylinder of diameter 25 mm and height 25 mm. Then cylinder is placed in Dory's testing machine and force of 12.50 NIS applied. The disc of testing machine is rotated at 28 revolutions per minute. During the rotation of the disc, coarse sand of standard specification is sprinkled on the top of disc. After 1000 revolutions specimen is weighed, W2. Coefficient of hardness equals 20. Impact test. This test is carried out to determine the toughness of stone. This test requires an impact testing machine. In this test, stones are filled in test cylinder of diameter 25 mm and height 25 mm. The cylinder is placed on machine and steel hammer of weight 20 NIS allowed to fall on the specimen Indiana cylinder. The height of first fall is 1 cm, height of second fall is 2 cm and so on. The height at which specimen breaks is recorded. If specimen breaks at NCM then N is the toughness index of stone. Microscopic test in this test specimen of stones is placed under microscope and various properties are studied such as grain size, texture of stone, pores, veins, shakes etc. Attrition test This test is carried out to test the resistance to abrasion, ability to withstand grinding action, of stone. This test is carried out in attrition test machine in this test specimen of stone is weighed, W1. Then stones are transferred to drum and drum is inclined to 30 degree to the horizontal. Then stones are revolved at 2000 revolution per hour for 5 hours. After this stones are sieved on a 2 mm sieve. Stones retained on sieve are weighed. W2, and loss in weight percentage gives the percentage of wear. Uses of stones Broken stones or stones in the form of chips are used in foundations, floors, roofs, roadworks and railway ballast. Stones are used in exterior finishing of buildings. Stones are also used as an aggregate. Stones are used for monumental and ornamental work. For example Taj Mahal in India is made up of marble. Stones are used in bridges, dams etc. Stones in the form of slabs are used in kitchen. Precious stones are used for astrological purpose such as gem stones. Stonemasonry Construction Materials and Classification Stonemasonry We will briefly discuss the stonemasonry, its types and construction of different types of stonemasonry, Rubble masonry and ashlar masonry, used in construction. Stone masonry has been in use in many places from ancient times. Where stones are easily available, random rubble work will be cheaper than plastered brickwork. Where the ground water level is high, and bricks are liable to deteriorate, random rubber work is preferred even today for foundation work. The sizes of stones used in stone masonry work depend on the type of masonry. The stones should not be larger than what can be handled and placed by one person. For ashlar work, it is specified that the length should not exceed three times its height. 
the breadth should not be greater than three-fourths of the thickness of the wall or less than 15 cm. The height can be up to 30 cm. Generally, in random rubble work, larger stones are used on the faces and smaller ones at the harding. For example, whereas ordinary random rubble work can be specified in foundation, backside compound walls or garden walls. Ashler work will be more fitting in monumental buildings or even as main front walls of buildings and roadside compound walls. Tools for Stone Masonry Tools for stone masonry depend on the region where the work is carried out and the workmen carrying out the work. But following are some of the common tools used in stone masonry. 1 chisel 2 iron hammer 3 mallet 4 pick 5 spalling hammer 6 claw tool 7 pitching tool 8 jumpers 9 saw 10 gads 11 wedge and feathers Materials used for stone masonry The materials used for stone masonry are Stones Mortar Stones The stones used for masonry construction must be hard, tough and free from cracks, sand holes, and cavities. The selection of stone for particular work is dependent on the availability of the stone and the importance of the structure. The common stones used for masonry construction are limestone, sandstone, granite, marble, laterite, etc. Mortar The binding material used for masonry construction is the mortar. Cement or lime with sand and water form the mix for masonry mortar. The mix formed is uniform in nature. The two main factors affecting the selection of mortar for masonry are Strength required Color of the stone The loads coming on the structure Classification of stone masonry The two main classifications of stone masonry are Rubble Masonry Ashler Masonry Rubble Masonry This is the stone masonry type where stones employed are either undressed or roughly dressed. These masonry constructions do not have a uniform thickness. The strength of the rubble masonry is dependent on the Quality of mortar used Use of long through stones Proper filling of mortar between the stone spaces and joints Types of rubble masonry There are many types of rubble masonry, but the more commonly known ones are the following three according to the CPWD specification 77 Random rubble masonry Coarsed rubble masonry of the first sort Coarsed rubble masonry of the second sort Random rubble masonry Random rubble masonry is the first variety of stone masonry. Stones are arranged at random in random rubble masonry. The minimum thickness of random rubble work that can be constructed with great care is 225 mm, 9 inches, 
and with ease 300 mm, 1 FET. The offsets to be provided in rubble masonry construction have to be 75 mm, 3 inches, on either side. Work for footings has to be adjusted to these sites. Random rubble masonry is the roughest type of stone masonry. The stones used are quarried in such a manner and of such sizes so that they can be lifted and placed by hand. It is only hammer dressed on the face, the side, and the beds. The bushing in the face should not project more than 40 mm on an exposed face and 10 mm on a face to be plastered. Its appearance will be as shown in figure. The mortar for this masonry is 1,5 up to 1,8. The mortar for plaster should be 1,3 or 1,4. The stones are laid on their natural bed on a full even bed of mortar. Every stone is carefully fitted to the adjacent stones so as to form neat and close joints. Stones should be wetted before being placed. Stonework should be brought to a level at window sills and roof level with concrete made of one part of mortar not leaner than that used in the masonry and two parts of graded stone of 20 mm nominal size. This practice should be adopted in compound walls also. Face stones, stones placed on the faces of the wall, should extend and bond well into the backing. They should not be less than 125 mm in height and should be hammer dressed. These should break joints as much as possible. The harding or interior tilling of the wall should consist of rubble stones which may be of any shape but not less than 125 mm in size. These are laid carefully and hammered down with a wooden mallet into the position and solidly bedded in mortar. Chips and spalls of stones are used, if needed, to avoid thick mortar beds. The harding should be nearly level with the facing. Where the masonry of one part has to be delayed, the work is sloped at an angle, not more than 45 degrees. Toothing of stonework for joins is not recommended. A sufficient number of bond stones which are long enough to extend the full thickness of the wall should be used in random rubble work. Joints should be fully packed with mortar and chips. Face joints should not be more than 20 mm thick. The face can be left as built, pointed, or plastered. If pointing or plastering is to be done, the joints should be raked to a minimum depth of 20 mm by a racking tool, as in brickwork, when the mortar is still green. Single scaffolding with one set of vertical legs is allowed for the construction of these walls of adequate thickness. Such holes are later filled with a properly sized stone or with cement concrete 1 colon 3 colon 6 with 20 mm aggregates. The walls are to be cured for a minimum period of 7 days, the fresh work being protected from rain and sun. Coarsed rubble masonry of the first sort This is the second type of rubble masonry and is built in courses, not random. In this type of work, the stones on both faces are hammer dressed on all the beds and joints so as to give them approximately rectangular block shape. This type of rubble masonry should be squared on all joints and beds, and the bed joints shall be rough chisel dressed for at least 80 mm back from the face. Stones are set in regular courses. 
The height of the course should not be less than 150 mm. Work on the interior face is to be the same as on the exterior face. Similarly, the side joints are dressed for at least 40 mm so that no portion of the dressed surface is more than 6 mm from a straight edge placed on it. The hammer dressed stones should have rough tooling for a minimum width of 25 mm along the four exposed edges of the face of the stone. The bushing on the face should not project more than 40 mm on an exposed face and 10 mm on a face to be plastered. The percentage of stone chips used should not exceed 10% of the total stones used for the masonry. In general, the work is carried out using the same mortar as in random rubble work. Its appearance when finished will be as shown in figure. The face joints should not be more than 10 mm thick. Coarsed rubble masonry of the second sort. This is the third type of rubble masonry and is also built in courses. It is inferior to the coarsed rubble masonry of the first sort but will look similar. No portion of the dressed surface should be more than 10 mm from a straight edge placed on it. In this type of work, the face joints should not exceed 20 mm in thickness, 10 mm in the first sort. Thus, the joints are allowed to be thicker than those in the first sort. This type of work is more expensive than random rubble work but cheaper than coarse rubble of the first sort. The percentage of chips used is not to exceed 15% of the quantity of stones in the masonry. Its appearance is shown in figure. Bond stones in rubble work one of the important features of rubble masonry work is the use of bond stones. These are long selected stones placed from front to back of thin walls or from outside to the interior of thick walls. They hold together the masonry walls transversely. If single stones of sufficient length are available, a pair of stones each penetrating three-fourths of the thickness of the wall with a minimum overlap of 150 mm. Or a set of stones each overlapping 150 mm can be used as bond stones. If separate bond stones of ample lengths are not available or the available stones are porous to develop damp penetration, concrete bond stones made from one, 3. 6. Concrete mix and of the specified length can be used as bond stones. In many specifications, the use of a certain number of bond stones is mandatory. The recommended specification is that it should not be spaced at more than 1200 mm horizontally and 600 mm vertically. Classification of Stone Masonry The two main classifications of stone masonry are Rubble Masonry Ashlar Masonry Rubble Masonry This is the stone masonry type where stones employed are either undressed or roughly dressed. These masonry constructions do not have a uniform thickness. The strength of the rubble masonry is dependent on the quality of mortar used. Use of long through stones. Proper filling of mortar between the stone spaces and joints. Classification of stone masonry. The two main classifications of stone masonry are Rubble masonry Ashlar masonry 
Rubble Masonry This is the stone masonry type where stones employed are either undressed or roughly dressed. These masonry constructions do not have a uniform thickness. The strength of the rubble masonry is dependent on the Quality of mortar used Use of long through stones Proper filling of mortar between the stone spaces and joints Classification of stone masonry The two main classifications of stone masonry are Rubble Masonry Ashler Masonry Rubble Masonry This is the stone masonry type where stones employed are either undressed or roughly dressed. These masonry constructions do not have a uniform thickness. The strength of the rubble masonry is dependent on the Quality of mortar used Use of long through stones Proper filling of mortar between the stone spaces and joints Rubble masonry can be again classified into Coarsed rubble masonry Uncoerced rubble masonry Dry rubble masonry Polygonal Masonry Flint Masonry Coarsed Rubble Masonry In coarsed rubble masonry construction, the stones in a particular course are in equal heights. The stones hence used possess different sizes. In this type, all the courses do not have same height. This type is commonly employed in the construction of public buildings, abutments, residential buildings, and piers of ordinary bridges. Uncoerced rubble masonry and uncoerced rubble masonry is the cheapest and roughest form of stone masonry construction. These construction use stones of varied shape and size. The stones are directly taken from the quarry called as undressed stone blocks. The courses is not maintained regularly in this method of construction. Initially larger stones are laid first. The spaces between them are filled with spalls or sneaks. This is divided into two types. Random uncoerced rubble masonry Square Uncoerced Rubble Masonry Random Uncoerced Rubble Masonry In this type, the weak corners and edges of the stone are removed with the help of a mason's hammer. At the coins and jams, bigger stones are employed in order to increase the strength of the masonry. Square Uncoerced Rubble Masonry here, the stones are made roughly square shape and used in construction. The facing stones are provided a hammer dressed finish. Larger stones are used as coins. Chips are not used as bedding. Polygonal rubble masonry here, the stones for masonry are roughly shaped into irregular polygons. The stones are then arranged in such a way that it avoids vertical joints in the face work. Break the joints as possible. Use of stone chips to support the stones. Flint Rubble Masonry In areas where flint is available plenty, a flint rubble masonry is employed. Flints are irregularly shaped nodules of silica. They are extremely hard but brittle in nature. The thickness of the flint stones varies from 8 to 15 cm. Their length varies from 15 to 30 cm. Dry Rubble Masonry These are rubble masonry construction performed without the use of mortar. 
small spaces are filled with smaller stone pieces. It is used in pitching the earthen dams and the canal slopes. Ashler Masonry Ashler Masonry is constructed using accurately dressed stones that possess uniform and fine joints. The thickness of the joints ranges about 3 mm which is arranged in various patterns. The size of the stone blocks must be in proportion with the thickness of the walls. The various types of ashlar masonry are Ashlar fine masonry Ashlar block in course Ashlar chamfered masonry Ashlar rough tooled masonry Rock or quarry faced masonry Ashlar fine masonry in ashlar fine masonry construction, each stone is cut into uniform size and shape, almost rectangular in shape. This shape hence provides perfect horizontal and vertical joints with the adjacent stones. An ashlar fine masonry construction is very costly. Ashlar rough masonry this type has stones whose sides are finely chisel dressed. The face of the stones is made rough by means of tools. Around the perimeter of the rough dressed face of each stone, a strip of 25 mm width is provided. Rock and quarry faced This masonry type has a 25 mm wide strip made by a chisel placed around the perimeter of every stone. The remaining portion of the face is left in the same form as it is received. Ashlar block in coarse masonry This type is a combination of ashlar masonry and rubble masonry. The face's work of the masonry stones is either rough tooled or hammer dressed stones. The backing of the wall may be done in rubble masonry. Ashlar chamfered masonry A strip is provided as shown in the figure below. But the sides are chamfered or beveled at an angle of 45 degrees by means of a kiesel at a depth of 25 mm. 10 Basic Principles of Stone Masonry Try to lay sedimentary stones, limestones and sandstones, so their natural bedding planes, BP, are horizontal, not vertical with the natural cleft, NC, face exposed. No stone should be laid taller than it is long, except at corners. Avoid block or running joints only one stone on at least one side of a vertical joint. Avoid setting more than three stones against a riser. Risers should be evenly distributed throughout the wall. Grouping together of like-sized stones should be avoided. Avoid using more than two stones of the same size on top of each other. Unless by design, avoid the lining up of vertical joints in alternate courses. Generally, risers should never touch except at corners and openings, jams. Don't allow horizontal joints to run more than 4 or 5 feet. If possible, break up the horizontals on short stretches between windows and doors. Advantages and Disadvantages of Stone Masonry Advantages of Stone Masonry Durable, strong, weather resistant. Stone is one of the most chosen masonry materials because it is the most durable, strong, and weather resistant masonry material out there. Stone does not warp, swell, bend, splinter, or dent, making it a great choice for building in areas where there is a lot of foot traffic or day-to-day -day activities. 
Stone can also be used in any weathered environment as stone is not affected by wind, rain, hails, sleet or snow. Long Lasting With stone being very durable and weather resistant, it is a popular choice for masonry contractors and customers for its long lasting characteristics. By building with stone, you are avoiding the risk of spending money on costly repairs as stone is hard to chip, bend or scratch. Keeping your stone masonry project in pristine shape as the years go on. Aesthetic Appeal Another reason why stone is such a popular masonry choice is for its aesthetic appeal. Stone comes in a variety of sizes, colors, and textures. Using stone material is a great way to break out your creative side as you can mix and match different colors and sizes to make your dream masonry project. From walkways to walls, building with stone is a surefire way to add a great masonry piece that will look great and stand the test of time. Disadvantages of Stone Masonry The weight of the natural stone is heavier than artificial stone, and therefore its use in the building is time-consuming. Climate and environmental changes affect the texture of the rock and cause cracking, mildew, and dandruff on the surface. Natural stones are removed from the building's body due to atmospheric and non-sticking agents over time. Thank you for watching. For now, please subscribe, like, share and do not forget to press bell icon.